First Lady of the Theater, Miss Helen Hayes. Love and loyalty to one's country have never been exclusive attributes of men. Women, too, throughout American history, have given concrete evidence of their devotion. American women have always taken their full share of responsibility. Today, as in the past, our women will meet the challenge. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And that I will obey. And that I will obey. The orders of the President of the United States. The orders of the President of the United States. And the orders of the officers appointed over me. And the orders of the officers appointed over me. According to regulations. According to regulations. And the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. So help me God. With the prescribed words of the oath of enlistment, you entered the service of your country. No longer a civilian, you have dedicated yourself to its security in peace its total defense in time of war. And with these same solemn words, you, as a servicewoman, inherited an exalted tradition and became yourself a living part of that heritage, the illustrious heritage of the Women's Army Corps. As members of the Women's Army Corps, the heroism of generation after generation of American women is the bequest of history to you. But until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941 made war in actuality, the army remained an impenetrable world of men. Even in the emergency, congressional opposition to granting women their rightful place died hard. Pioneer women faced the perils of the vast ocean and the rigors of frontier life to create homes for their families, the homes that established this nation. They learned new skills to survive and performed the drudgery of their daily tasks against a background of ever-present danger. To you of the Women's Army Corps, these American women left their everyday courage, their instinctive knowledge that it takes an infinite number of small things done right to make a nation great. Even on the battlefield, American women have shown their bravery. In the Revolutionary War, Molly Pitcher took the place of her husband at this cannon when he fell at the Battle of Monmouth and won for herself a lasting place in the history of human courage. Another woman, Deborah Sampson Gannett, disguised as a man, served with distinction in the Continental Army before being discovered and discharged by General Washington. She had disguised herself as a man, for in her day, this was the only way she could serve in the Army. In later wars, Women served the army, but not in the army, as nurses, laundresses, clerks, and telephone operators. Nearly 13,000 women did serve in uniform in the Navy and Marine Corps. They were called yeomanettes and marinettes. They had full military rank and status, including veterans' benefits and were the first women in the United States to have these privileges. For two decades following the First World War, detailed plans were developed in the War Department for utilizing woman power in the Army. But until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941 made war in actuality, the Army remained an impenetrable world of men. Even in the emergency, Congressional opposition to granting women their rightful place died hard. I think it is a reflection upon the courageous manhood of the country 
to pass a law inviting women to join the armed forces in order to win a battle. Take the women into the armed forces, who then will do the cooking, the washing, the mending, the humble, homey tasks to which woman has always devoted herself. Think of the humiliation. What has become of the manhood of America? Because of objections such as these, Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall reluctantly accepted auxiliary status for the proposed Women's Army Corps. Yet more than six months of agonizing, desperate warfare had elapsed before the bill establishing the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was approved by Congress and presented to President Franklin D. Roosevelt for his signature on May 15, 1942. Ovita Culp Hobby, lawyer, publisher, and public-spirited woman who was deeply involved in the planning and passage of the measure, was selected to become its first director. And on the very next day, she was sworn in. Understaffed, the director and her assistants struggled to create a corps that would be an asset to the army and a credit to American womanhood. Undaunted, they faced wartime shortages of materiel and labor, the indifference and obstruction of old-line army bureaucrats, and the ridicule of sensation-seeking journalists. In little more than two months, the first WAC training center was set up at Fort Des Moines, Iowa. first officer candidate class began its training. Both for them and for the nation who are now embarking on an uncharted course, this was an event of tremendous significance. As Mrs. Hobby said four days later, From here on, your road is the hard, long way to victory. No one can forecast what this war will bring. I can give you no promise of what lies ahead of you. I can assure you that you will be serving the purpose you had in mind when you volunteered as officer candidate for the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Listening to I Director Hobby's speech, one of the candidates said, it was only then that I really knew what I had done in enlisting. I suddenly had no more doubt that it was right. My feet stopped hurting, and the war and my place in it became very real. And guide those who follow you. But there were plenty of other times in the next six weeks that feet ached, joints creaked, and eyes grew weary. As the candidates underwent unaccustomed hardships, large and small, in a modified version of the Army's basic training course. They learn military customs and courtesy, and close order drills, and such subjects as safeguarding information, first aid, map reading, and company administration. They became accustomed to the discomforts of the poorly designed uniform, the hot, stiff jackets made of men's material, and the hats which cut the forehead. Following their grueling training, when they were graduated, Congresswoman Edith Norse Rogers, who had fought long and hard for the establishment of the Corps, told them, you are soldiers and belong to America. Every hour must be your finest hour. And the head of the army, Chief of Staff General George C. Marshall said, this is only the beginning of a magnificent war service by the women of America. Class upon class followed each week thereafter until the end of the summer saw 3,000 officers and enlisted women at Fort Des Moines.
Within a few months, despite such crucial shortages as a lack of training equipment and winter uniforms, the women's auxiliary had developed its own character, its own esprit de corps, and its own songs. Training centers were rapidly opened up in Daytona Beach, Florida, Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, at Camps Polk and Ruston in Louisiana, and Camp Monticello in Arkansas. As WACs began their active service, they proved that they could replace men in a variety of army jobs. One enlisted woman could replace up to two men in some jobs, such as switchboard operator, stenographer, and typist. But while individual WACs were valiantly proving their worth, the continued auxiliary status of the Corps inevitably led to an administrative tangle. As General Marshall told the Congress, it is evident that the operation of the women's organization will be simplified and its efficiency vastly improved if it is made an actual component of the Army. Having the Corps with the Army, but not in it, also results in inequalities and injustices to its members. There is finally the important element of morale. Membership in the Army carries with it a natural and proper pride for which service in an adjunct of the army provides no satisfactory substitute. Congressional approval of the changeover to army status was granted early in July 1943. And Director Hobby was sworn in as the first woman colonel in the Army of the United States. When the Auxiliary Corps was abolished, 75% of its officers and enlisted women volunteered for service in the new Women's Army Corps. Behind them was accomplishment. Ahead of them, new challenge. Colonel Hobby took the occasion to define the significance of both past and future. This word to you is in a sense a hail and farewell. A farewell to the members of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps and a hail to the members of the Women's Army Corps. You have written a fine page in the history of women at war, in this war of survival. There are other pages to write before we can say as women, mission accomplished. We must accept the leadership of those responsible for the success of our army. This means that we may not always work at the job for which we feel we are best fitted. The jobs we do, whether exciting or dull, must be done. Which one of us is prepared to say, my work is unimportant? There is a deep satisfaction in saying to your country, in its hour of need, here am I, use me. Do you remember your thoughts the day you put the palace, Athene of the Wax, on your uniform? Did you think, perhaps, how closely the goddess of victory and wisdom symbolized the very things that made you volunteer? all your strength to the task at hand, all your help to victory. 
Did you feel the awe which comes from dedicating one's strength to the issues at stake? It is the feeling which comes over us while we stand retreat. Proudly and soberly, we watch our country's flag against the sunset sky. Later, in 1950, the peace was once more shattered by the communist invasion of South Korea. This time, the Women's Army Corps was ready. Regular Army women trained in the Army ways. Time, women of the Army of the United States were leaving for all parts of the globe to serve in Europe and the Southwest Pacific. Wherever they went, they took with them the same determination to cope with difficulties and dangers that had inspired the pioneer women of generations past. In an age when new frontiers were hard to find, they had found one and they had crossed it as they impressed upon their nation their indispensability in time of war. Soon they, with their brothers in arms, partook of victory as Berlin fell to the Allied forces. A few months later, Japan was defeated. The Women's Army Corps went with the army to Tokyo. The war was over. With the mobilization, many wax came home to resume civilian status. But some remained as a part of the post-war army of occupation. But what of the Women's Army Corps itself? What was its future? It had been established over much opposition, strictly as a wartime measure. Would it survive the peace? Even Colonel Hobby, who had given her health to the establishment of the WAC, thought it should be reduced to an officer reserve, with only three officers on active duty to formulate policies. In the Pentagon, powerful groups thought that this would be three too many. Faced with this kind of opposition, the then acting director, Lieutenant Colonel Helen Woods, demanded an evaluation of the WAC record of service. Those in high command in the field, General Jacob L. Devers, General Eaker, and General Spots, all wanted the Corps to become a permanent part of the regular army. They knew of the record the Corps had achieved. Over 600 women were decorated with Distinguished Service Medals, Legion of Merit, Soldier's Medal, and Air Medal. Many others were attached to units that earned the Meritorious Service Award. Swayed by the recommendations of Generals Devers, Eaker, and Spots, Congress again smashed precedent by granting permanent status to the Corps. On 12 June 1948, President Harry S. Truman signed into law a bill which gave women the privilege of serving in the Army in peace as well as in war. Three years of painful uncertainty were ended. Colonel Mary A. Halloran took the oath of office in the WAC regular army and was appointed the third director of the Corps. And with equal ceremony, the first enlisted woman was sworn in by General Omar Bradley.
Members of this proud new corps expressed their gratitude to President Truman, whose signature had given them permanent status. Camp Lee, Virginia was established as the sixth training center and the first location for the new regular army members of the corps. The enlistment age dropped from 21 to 18. The corps, which had dwindled in the years of transition, once more expanded rapidly. With the same pay and privileges as a man, and with regular status, a woman could now plan a military career. At Camp Lee's new WAC school, enlisted women were trained in clerical and stenographic skills. Potential leaders were trained to become officers. Experienced officers were taught advanced procedures. Here, too, the WAC band, renamed the 14th Army Band, began the career which brought so much pride and pleasure to the Women's Army Corps. Music to march to. Music to dance to. Music to listen to. Two years later, in 1950, the peace was once more shattered by the communist invasion of South Korea. This time, the Women's Army Corps was ready. Regular Army women trained in the Army ways. Skilled in their jobs. There were women reserves who could be called upon to return to duty. There were tried and proven methods for expanding the Corps without fumbling, without hysteria. There was professionalism. There was a tradition of service. There was a heritage. Members of the Corps were already on their way to Okinawa, Japan, and later Korea itself. 30% of the entire Corps served overseas during the Korean conflict. In headquarters, in laboratories, in hospitals. A polished, prepared, professional force of trained woman power. And when they came back, it was to a new permanent home, Fort McClellan in Anniston, Alabama, a spacious cantonment cradled in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. It was the first WAC headquarters especially built to suit its needs. This was to be a symbol of their new full-hearted acceptance by the Army. As General Ridgway said, This effort has translated an idea into a living reality. Here, the accumulating traditions of the Women's Army Corps will be passed on to those yet to wear the proud insignia of the WAC. They will become familiar with the splendid achievements of their predecessors and with the great honor and responsibility that is theirs in wearing the uniform of their country's armed forces. The training that the WACs will receive here will enable the Women's Army Corps to meet successfully every challenge that tomorrow may bring. And tomorrow brought the challenge of Vietnam. WACs were assigned as advisors to the Vietnamese Women's Armed Forces Corps in 1965. As the need increased for skilled clerical personnel, our commanders requested more enlisted women. A WAC detachment was established in 1966, and Vietnam was added to World War II and the Korean conflict to make the third time that women in the Corps supported the combat soldiers. This, then, is the heritage that became yours when you enlisted and entered your country's service. Yours may seem a small role, but remember, all who serve in the Women's Army Corps serve significantly, and no woman who wears her country's uniform plays an obscure role. As you march through the path of the flags of the 50 states, you feel the meaning of their symbolism, and you feel proud.
honor, country. These words have real meaning for you now. for your role in the ceremony, aware that you are part of your country. You, like other American women through a quarter of a century, are having a date with destiny, paying a debt to democracy by serving in the Women's Army Corps.